ABC and Peter Jennings. House of Representatives cutting more than a trillion dollars in spending. The billion to one odds at the O.J. Simpson trial. New testimony about the blood. And religious leaders mount a holy war against genetic engineering. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We begin tonight with one of the most controversial budgets in modern American history. Today in the House of Representatives, the Republicans passed their budget resolution. That is their plan to eliminate more than a trillion dollars in government spending, reduce taxes for some Americans, eliminate government services for others, and balance the federal budget in seven years. The Republicans say this is courageous. The Democrats say it is mean-spirited. And it all went through the House so fast, there is some question as to whether the average American really knows what happened. Our first reporter from ABC's John Cochran on Capitol Hill. While the House fought over the budget, Speaker Newt Gingrich was telling seventh graders they had come on an historic day, marking the beginning of the end for Democratic spending, dating back to the era of Franklin Roosevelt. This is my voting card. This is... This is the most expensive credit card in the world. And we're charging it for them to pay off, and it's not fair, and it's not right. House Republicans would cut $1.5 trillion in spending over seven years and use $350 billion of the savings for tax cuts. The biggest savings, $270 billion, would come from projected spending on Medicare. Republicans would also kill three cabinet departments and 284 programs ranging from mass transit subsidies to legal aid for the poor. Democrats Medicare. fought back with pictures Those of constituents like Alpha Dunlap. Question. Is it fair to cut $1,000 from Alpha Dunlap's Medicare benefits to pay for tax breaks for millionaires such as Donald Trump? Is it fair? The Democratic leaders said Republicans needed to see the faces of people who will be affected. You're voting for flesh and blood people who depend on you. But two could play at that game as Republicans trotted out their own pictures of their own families. I'm going to be proud to vote for a balanced budget so I give people like my little Dallas or my little Heather back their freedom. A pregnant Republican didn't have a picture, but... My baby and every baby born this year will pay $187,000 in their lifetime for interest on the debt alone. Budget Committee Chairman John Kasich admitted spending cuts will anger some voters. It's about facing hard issues. It's about having to, to stare somebody square in the eye and say, you know, I'd love to help you, but I've got to put the kids first. And Kasich got his budget resolution, which by law cannot be overturned by presidential veto. And a good thing for Republicans, too, because they didn't have the votes to overturn a veto. And that will be a problem later. The president does have the power to veto specific spending cuts. John Cochran, ABC News, Capitol Hill. This is Jackie Judd. Some economists say Republicans are seeing things through rose-colored glasses, that the success of their budget depends on perfect economic conditions. They kind of build a house of cards. And if you pull one card out, then the whole package is less credible. A bunch of the other cards collapse. Republicans assume there will be no recession in the next seven years, that unemployment will be low, interest rates will fall because of market confidence, they assume a new way of measuring inflation will produce lower rates and therefore lower cost of living adjustments in Social Security and that medical costs will level off, leaving seniors unaffected by a leveling off in Medicare spending. Republican Kevin Phillips doubts the math and the virtue of the budget. What you've got here is politicians using the deficit issue to promote spending and tax changes that favor their side. Part of it's deficit reduction, but part of it's Republican politics. Critics also question the Republican schedule, asking what's the rush? Slow down spending, they say, but why take only seven years to try to get rid of a deficit that took 25 years to accumulate? They believe there is no magic in achieving a perfectly balanced budget by 2002 or ever. Exact balance really isn't that important. It's just like a family going into debt for gambling bills is bad, but if you incur some debt to send a child to college so that child earns more in the long run, that would be a debt worth incurring. Some economists say in the rush to slash the deficit, the Republicans are depending too much on hope and hurt. Jackie Judd, ABC News, Washington. 
Late today, the White House said that President Clinton also wants to reduce the deficit, but in his words, there is a right way and a wrong way, and this is the wrong way. On Wall Street today, the profit takers took over. The Dow Jones Industrials lost nearly 82 points to close at 43.40. The trading was moderate. On the Nasdaq market, stocks lost nearly 8 points. In a moment, we'll have some of the day's other news. At the O.J. Simpson trial, astronomical odds on the blood evidence. Biotechnology companies who patent genes, religious leaders say that is playing God. And home again after 60 years, the wolves in the wilds of Yellowstone. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Brought to you by Royal Caribbean Cruise Line. A sparkling ship on crystal waters is coming. Absolutely gorgeous. It was so much fun. The perfect lobster is coming. Our readers, they would do anything for us. Any time. Perfection is coming. It's like a gift from the captain. Memories are coming. Seven days in Royal Caribbean's Bermuda are coming. You've got some Royal Caribbean coming. Just ask any of the people who took it today why only Zantac is Zantac. Just ask any of their doctors. They've seen what Zantac can do. You can't get Zantac without a prescription. Ask your doctor if Zantac is right for you. Only Zantac is Zantac. Finally, some fresh thinking in a minivan. Rear windows that go down. Introducing Odyssey with four doors and an easy fold-away seat. It's not just a minivan. It's a Honda. At the O.J. Simpson trial in Los Angeles today, a DNA expert, Gary Sims, who was a witness, was asked to calculate the odds that the blood found at various sites could have come from someone other than O.J. Simpson and the two victims. ABC's Aaron Brown on the results. The numbers may be as damning as they are staggering. Take just the socks found in O.J. Simpson's bedroom. According to the prosecution's numbers, the probability that some blood on those socks belong to anyone other than Nicole Brown are no better than one in almost eight billion. Compared to that, the chances that blood found on the Bundy walkway belong to someone other than O.J. Simpson are much smaller, but still formidable. That range would be one in 240,000 to one in 2.2 million. These are the kinds of numbers that make defense attorneys wince. And Barry Sheck did a lot of wincing and a lot of objecting and neither got him very far. No Overruled. foundation for this witness. Overruled. To Can I state it? Overruled. No, Sit down. No. Right. Indeed, the judge was taking no guff from anyone today. When jurors who have been paying rapt attention complained about two reporters talking during testimony, the judge slapped the reporters too. And those persons will be banned from further attendance at the court. Prosecutor Rockney Harmon concluded his examination by going after a pet defense theory that evidence was contaminated accidentally or deliberately. Do you have an opinion? Should contamination occur, it can be recognized. Yes, in most cases it can. The defense must offer some explanation for all the DNA results presented so far. And Sheck focused on a favorite defense target, the LAPD crime lab. The reliability of the testing is no stronger than the weakest link in that chain. Yes, that's true, said Sims. And then Sheck began trying to show that LAPD was the weak link that the way it handled evidence made even inadvertent contamination possible. Prosecutors have been crowing about the power of their DNA evidence and how it indicts Mr. Simpson. Sheck's task is to make certain the jury isn't so sure. Aaron Brown, ABC News, Los Angeles. Other news today, a judge in Oklahoma ruled that there is probable cause to continue holding Terry Nichols for further investigation. Nichols and Timothy McVeigh remain the only two people charged so far in the bombing of the Felder building in Oklahoma City. We did learn today that Nichols may have been far from the scene when the bomb went off. Here's ABC's Mark Potter. During the two-hour hearing at a federal prison, the Justice Department said it now appears that Terry Nichols was at his home in Harrington, Kansas, and not on the scene when the federal building was destroyed. We have some indications in the form of telephone records from his house that morning that he was not in Oklahoma City the morning of the bombing. But the government still argued that Nichols was deeply involved in the bombing and again cited the large fertilizer purchases and the items found at his home that could have been used to make the Oklahoma bomb. 
Nichols' attorney, Michael Tiger, argued that Nichols is innocent and is being targeted simply because he knew Tim McVeigh. He claimed the government misinterpreted the evidence. I kind of believe what Sherlock Holmes said to Watson. It's like a stick on the ground. And it does point in one direction, so you turn around and look at it from the other side, then it points just equally in the other direction. For example, Tiger argued that many of the items seized by the FBI in Nichols' home are commonly found in farming communities, where homemade explosives are used to blow up tree stumps and to dig ditches. But the Justice Department replied there is no evidence that Nichols' house in a Harrington neighborhood was ever used as a farm. Meanwhile, Tim McVeigh's lawyer complained that his client is being subjected to a 24-hour camera surveillance in his prison cell. I see the camera as simply an attempt to engage uh, uh, in uh, a kind of a psychological warfare, and I think ultimately would have an effect on his mental stability. This Saturday, McVeigh's legal team will get its first chance to cross the police lines and examine the bombing site. Mark Potter, ABC News, Oklahoma City. Police in San Diego have spent the day trying to figure out what caused an unemployed plumber to go on a rampage in a stolen 63-ton army tank. As ABC's Ken Kashiwahara reports, the incident only ended after the driver was shot and killed by police and an enormous amount of damage had been done. We had a tank that left the armory. It's crushed numerous vehicles. It's like a war zone over here. For half an hour, 35-year-old Sean Nelson took the tank on a rampage, cutting a path of destruction through San Diego neighborhoods. He ran over my truck, and then he took out the telephone poles over there, and he headed down the street and ran over that blue car right there. Police said Nelson stole the tank from a National Guard armory, then used it to terrorize residents. He ran up over a cyclone fence about a foot from a house, and then stopped, revved his engines, and then took back out. I, th I thought he was going to run through the house. Dozens of cars and a trailer home were damaged or destroyed. So were utility poles and fire hydrants. No one was injured. Police gave chase but were powerless to stop the 58-ton tank until it got stuck on a concrete freeway divider. Officials said they ordered Nelson to surrender and when he tried to move the tank again, shot and killed him. He would have not only struck many vehicles out there, it is sure to have caused serious injury or death. Police said Nelson was a former Army tank crew member who had suffered a series of setbacks recently, lost his job as a plumber, had his utilities turned off, and recently broke up with his girlfriend. Neighbors said Nelson had talked of suicide. Today, National Guard officials said they are investigating how Nelson was able to break through security and steal the tank. That's what terrified residents would like to know, too. Ken Kashiwahara, ABC News. We'll be back in just a moment. Denture wearers, guess what? New Holiday works so fast it cleans and fights denture odor in just five minutes. You'll love New Polident, honey. Works in just five minutes. Now, Polident saves you time and money. Look for this $1 coupon in Sunday's paper. some extra cash? Play the $50,000 hometown jackpot. It's easy. Every time you play, it pays. Watch News 2 at 5. The second caller with a secret word wins $500 instantly. And watch News 2 at 6. It's double jackpot worth a cool thousand. Wait, did someone say $5,000? It's $5,000 Fridays with any five secret words on News 2 at 6. The $50,000 hometown jackpot you could win tonight instantly on News 2 at 5 and 6. Gordy, take care of the family. People tell me they're outraged by the lack of wholesome G-rated movies. Hollywood says there's no demand, but you've told me there is. But where are you? Gordy received terrific reviews and audience reaction. But the number of families who've seen Gordy is perplexing. Was I naive in creating a company dedicated to only making family movies? Your support this weekend will decide. Gordy, rated G. When I have diarrhea, I could use some comforting. I get it from Kaopectate. Just a couple spoonfuls of creamy, soothing Kaopectate is all it takes. Kaopectate, there's still nothing else quite like it. Tonight, on day one, 
never before heard courtroom tapes of accused bomber Terry Nichols with harsh words for our government. A Brian Ross exclusive. Day one, tonight at 10, 9 central. In Washington today, the battle between religion and science has entered a new dimension. A coalition of more than 80 religious leaders has attacked the cornerstone of the multi-billion dollar biotechnology industry. They want the government to prohibit the patenting of human genes. Here's ABC's George Strait. Religious leaders say they are embarking on a holy war against genetic engineering. They say life is sacred and must not be changed by humans. We see altering life forms, creating new life forms, as a revolt against God's sovereignty and the attempt by humankind to usurp God and to be God. They say scientists should not be allowed to patent a human gene, or have exclusive rights to experiment on it, or market any products made by the gene. Life has intrinsic value. The patenting of genes, the building blocks of life, reduces it to its economic worth. Biotechnology industry officials say their research has nothing to do with religion. The religious leaders don't understand perhaps what our goals are. Our goals are not to play God, they're to play doctor. Lisa Raines' company, Genzyme, owns a patent on a gene that causes cystic fibrosis. That research has led to the development of the first drug to treat this fatal disease. Overall, treatments for dozens of diseases, from cancer to dwarfism affecting millions of people, have been developed by changing a gene discovered and patented by private industry. Officials of those companies say they don't own the gene. A patent means they are caretakers. It is a means for us to recoup the investment that it took for us to discover the gene. If there's not an ability to patent, uh, the financing of the research can't continue. The religious leaders say patenting and manipulating human genes diminishes respect for life. Most scientists say nothing could show more respect for life than research designed to prolong and improve it. George Strait, ABC News, Washington. In other news today, a punishing storm is moving through the middle of the country. For everyone who remembers the great flood of 1993, any significant rain makes a lot of people nervous. But while this storm isn't even close, it is causing flooding and some tornadoes. Here's ABC's Aaron Hayes. It is a vicious spring storm cutting a wide path of damage. In Nashville, Tennessee, a tornado tore at a shopping mall. Though it hit at noontime, most here escaped serious injury. In Nicholasville, Kentucky, a twister hit the high school this morning, just as students were beginning to arrive. It peeled away the roof of the gymnasium. About two dozen students were hurt, but none critically. And near St. Louis, Missouri, tornadoes did this. And as this big roar hit, everything That's exploded. Right, In Missouri, the storm has also brought heavy flooding. Some levees along the rivers have broken. At Jefferson City, Missouri, the airport is underwater. Okay, uh, Some river towns began evacuating. Got a hole in the sandbagging has begun in earnest. Many of the rivers here will not crest until Sunday, but with the storms passing and only scattered rain forecasts, the hope is that the waters will soon recede, that this will be just a one-time springtime flood. Aaron Hayes, ABC News, St. Louis. We heard today... Storm Center. This is a special report. I'm Davis Nolan. We continue to have more tornadoes popping up as we speak. We now have a tornado warning for Cheatham County. At Cheatham County in Tennessee till 6.30, a tornado was indicated near Cheatham Lock and Dam, which is near Cheap Hill, moving east-northeast at 35 miles an hour. And that's this set of storms right here that you see to the west of Nashville, moving east-northeast. They'll be pushing into Nashville, by the way, during the next 30 minutes or so. So you want to batten down the hatches in Davidson County as well. But this warning for Cheatham County until 6.30, a tornado reported near Cheatham Lock and Dam, moving towards the east northeast at 35 miles per hour. We also want to turn your attention to this storm down here in Lincoln County near Fayetteville. A tornado was indicated in Limestone County, Alabama, but it was moving east northeast to cross the Tennessee border into Lincoln County during the next 30 minutes. So in Lincoln County around Fayetteville, you need to watch out for this storm as well. So meanwhile, Cheatham County until 630, Lincoln County until 645. These are both tornado warnings, which means a tornado has been sighted. We continue to have tornado warnings also just about to expire, but still into effect for some of the places like northern Giles County as well as southern Murray County, but the storms have now left those regions at this time. Now, White County in Tennessee around the Sparta area, 
That's the storm that you see that's let leaves Murfreesboro right here, moves across Cannon County, and now ends up just south of Cookville, not too far from Center Hill Lake. So we now have a tornado warning in effect for White County in Tennessee until 6.30. Now, a tornado was indicated in northern Warren County, and it was moving into southern White County, expected to pass just south of Sparta. The movement was towards the east, northeast at 35 miles an hour. That's this storm right here. So we have a tornado warning right now for White County, the Sparta area, until 630. We also have a tornado warning in effect for Lincoln County and near the Fayetteville area, and that is going to be in effect until 6.45 p.m., and also a tornado warning for Cheatham County, with a tornado reported right near Cheatham Lock and Dam, not too far from Highway 12, and that was moving towards the east-northeast at about 35 miles per hour. Right now, we do not have a warning in effect for the Nashville metropolitan Davidson County area, but notice these storms with tornado warnings are just about... 25 to 30 miles to our west and moving rapidly east-northeast. We have a tornado watch in effect for the entire area. We all need to keep an eye on the sky, not just the folks in the warned counties, but all of us need to keep a close eye on the sky as these severe thunderstorms containing tornadoes push across our area. And once again, just to review, we have a tornado warning for Cheatham County, also for Lincoln County, Fayetteville, and for White County around Sparta. All of those until 6.30 and 6.45 p.m. Stay tuned to News 2. We'll have the latest as the weather develops. We now return to our regularly scheduled program, already in progress. Experiment in Palestinian self-rule. Today, one year later, Gaza is practically bankrupt. Here's ABC's Don Clatstrom. If the music sounds shaky and uncertain, so does everything else here. There's a new parliament building, which Yasser Arafat came to dedicate this week. But there's no parliament. There's produce, but few can afford it. There's construction, but no money to finish it. And there's squalor. Roads aren't paved, garbage isn't collected, phones don't work, and neither do most people. My life is one of despair. I don't have any hope. Just a year ago today, Auni Rebbe was celebrating the end of the Israeli occupation in Gaza. Since then, Islamic militants have launched suicide attacks against Israelis, prompting Israel to close its border with Gaza and prevent tens of thousands of Palestinians from getting to work. We are closed in. It's worse than a prison. Marwan Al-Halo had dreams a year ago, too. Today, he sits in his carpet shop, alone. I have no customers. No one has any money. In Gaza's gold shops, people are not buying, but selling. Selling jewelry from their wedding dowries, something Palestinians only do in what they call the black days. The situation certainly cannot continue like this. It's going to, uh, to explode if, if no improvement takes place. Nowhere is that more likely than in Jabalia, a refugee camp of open sewers and garbage, where at least half the children, tens of thousands, suffer from parasites and intestinal illnesses. Mayada Masoub's children are among them. I don't have money to buy them good food or clean clothes. Why talk about dreams? Our dreams will never come true. When Mayada was married, her husband gave her these gold bracelets, which she'll probably have to sell to buy food. In these, the black days. Don Cladstrup, ABC News, Gaza. Still overseas, Pope John Paul is 75. He has slowed down a great deal, but he says he intends to remain Pope as long as he lives. Most Popes do. The last one to resign was Celestine V in the year 1296. We'll be back in just a moment. While a brother may be hard to propel, the Hoover Power Drive is self-propelled, making cleaning so easy, even a brother can do it. Hoover, nobody does it like you. When I get gas, I feel like this, painfully bloated. That's why I use Gas-X. Gas-X has the most powerful medicine to fight gas faster than antacids. So I feel like me again. Painful gas needs the power of Gas-X. Leave it to Delta to design a stylish and practical faucet that works with you in perfect harmony. 
Delta, the way water is brought to life. If you're going to take a vacation, don't forget the Riviera. If you're going to fish the James, don't forget the Jimmy. Forget your GM MasterCard, today's financial vehicle. I can't fall asleep. I can't stay asleep. Try Nitol Quick Caps to fall asleep fast and get a good night's sleep. Get Nitol Quick Caps. Nitol will help you get your Z's. Finally from us this evening, how it is going with the wolves. It has been some time now since 14 Canadian wolves were released into Yellowstone National Park. It's a way of trying to repopulate the area. The last time we saw them, they were in a pen at Yellowstone, either unwilling or too polite to leave. They've come a long way. Here's ABC's Barry Serafin. The wolves have wandered in and out of Yellowstone since their release in March. These exclusive pictures were filmed by a wildlife photographer last month. The wolves appear to have adapted to their new home, finding food when they need it, and when they don't, ignoring other animals like bison and elk. The first known litter of pups was born outside the park a few weeks ago near Red Lodge, Montana. These pictures were taken today when government biologists captured the eight pups and their mother in order to transfer them back to Yellowstone. That was done because they were close to town. A local resident had already been charged with killing the pup's father. Chad McKittrick on the left, a 42-year-old unemployed carpenter, is quoted as telling a companion, it's a wolf, I'm going to shoot it. Federal agents recovered the wolf's remains on his property. McKittrick, charged with killing an endangered species, appeared in federal court today, but was given another week to enter a plea. If convicted, he could face a year in prison and $100,000 in fines. Bullets are not the only threat to the Yellowstone Wolf Program. Some Western senators want to shut off money to bring in more wolves. To fiddle around out there and, sp and spell $12 million on what? Because somebody... Uh, gets the idea that they want to hear the wolf howl, I think it's asking a lot. I think people like Senator Burns are just trying to get rid of it. They don't want to do things like restore wolves or bald eagles or grizzly bears. For now, the program remains in place with plans for a population of 100 wolves in Yellowstone by the year 2002. Barry Serafin, ABC News. And that is our report on World News Tonight. Later on day one, exclusive courtroom tapes of the Oklahoma bomb suspect, Terry Nichols. I'm Peter Jennings. Good night. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.